So my name is uh, Christopher Cameron. I'm a computational scientist with the Cornell University Center for Advanced Computing. Today I'm talking about Jupyter Lab in the cloud for Python. Uh, I'm really going to focus today on SageMaker as one example of a cloud-based Jupyter installation. Uh, the reason for that is that it is the one that I think you're most likely to encounter if you're from uh, Wild Cornell. Um, there's a current effort underway to evaluate it and see about offering it as a, as a service. I'm joined today by uh, my colleague, Chris Myers, who will be helping to field questions about uh, Python in the chat. So there'll be more than one of us responding if you ask questions. So there's two, two parts of the talk today. One part is what is Jupyter Lab, um, in case you haven't heard of it before. Um, I will be linking out to or referring to uh, pr prior presentations that I've given about Jupyter Lab. So this will be a an overview, and if you would like to see more information, we have a recording of a previous talk uh, where I introduced the details of Jupyter Lab and um, focusing just on its own interface. Today, we'll focus on cloud-based interfaces. And then um, I'll talk about how cloud-based Jupyter is different. Um, we'll be using SageMaker as our main example there, and I'll look a little bit at Google Colab um, in case you're interested in, in that product. And I want to point out that Jupyter and Python take time to learn, and this could be your first step. And I know that it looks like a in very initial, um, it, it looks like a steep learning curve at first, um, if you don't have the background knowledge, but it, it's a surmountable uh, learning curve. Uh, it looks steep at first, but it'll level out if you invest some time. So, and works, this kind of workshop um, is a great way to get over that initial learning curve. So why do we even care about computational notebooks and Jupyter Lab notebooks? Um, it's because of this, this idea of literate analysis, which actually started um, in 1984 with this idea of literate programming. Uh, a rather famous programmer thought about what, what if our documentation and code were uh, treated as a single piece of literature and uh, we we wrote it all in kind of one one place, and there was documentation interspersed with actual code. And wouldn't that be an interesting way to do programming? And it was a revolutionary idea that just did not catch on in software engineering. Uh, but that the buzz created from that you know initial idea uh, appealed to some people programming Mathematica, which was a mathematician's notebook. And it turns out that people doing research actually really like this idea of literate programming. They don't like it so much for uh, documenting their code. They like it to create a research narrative and to, to share their research narrative. And so a couple of tools, very popular tools today have grown out of this idea of literate programming. It's become literate analysis. And now we have Python with Jupyter Notebook. And in R, we have R Markdown and Quarto, which is the evolution of R Markdown. And so if you've seen either one of those things, you'll be you're kind of familiar with the idea of uh, a literate analysis or a scientific computational notebook. The, the underlying idea here is that a research narrative is composed of, of many components. There's text expl explanation, there's sort of an overall organization, there's uh, mathematics, maybe, there's images, there's code, there's data, there's other dependencies, and all those things are components. And if you put them into a computational notebook, you you take those components and you put them in different types of cells that contain that kind of component, and your document becomes a sequence of this of cells that represent uh, different components of your research, and you structure it so it creates a narrative. And on top of that that narrative, you have an organizational structure, so like an outline, um, that lets someone make sense of this this narrative you're presenting. And to make it a computational narrative, the cells that involve computation are executable. So you can actually run the code right there in the, in the notebook and see the results right there in the notebook. So you can perform your analysis uh, while you're documenting it. And you can someone could repeat your analysis by taking your notebook and re-executing it. And you can see in, the, in a regular Jupyter Lab interface, it has all those elements. It's got your... your um, an outline structure on one side, and then it has the uh, cells of different types that uh, represent the components of a research narrative. And this has been really popular. And if, you, if this is the first time you've seen Jupyter Lab, I encourage you to look into it uh, more and 
uh, many people are probably already using Jupyter Lab locally, or they're using R Markdown locally. Um, and today we'll talk about using it in the cloud. This is this has become this is popular for for researchers. This is a nice way to represent and share your data, your research narratives, not just your data, but your whole analysis. So Jupyter Lab is a browser-based interface for interactive data uh, data science. It works good for uh, data analysis. It's good for scripting. Inside of Jupyter Lab, the main type of document is a notebook, which you saw an example of. It's those. It's a document composed of cells with of different uh, types that represent components of a research project. You could use Jupyter Notebooks uh, to, you can share those directly with other scientists, or you can export them to a variety of formats. The more popular ones, um, web pages, and um, books. So as a history of new of Jupyter Lab, you, you may have encountered it in other forums in the past. Um, there was the Mathematica interactive math notebooks they, that came out. The, they were the first sort of notebook that was really embraced by researchers. Then there was the IPython notebook, which you may have encountered in the past. Um, that became Jupyter Notebook when it's moved from supporting just Python to supporting other languages. The first three languages were Julia, uh, Python, and R. And a little bit later, we had Jupyter Lab, which is an evolution of that Jupyter Notebook interface uh, that gives it more features. So uh, most recently, they've added several IDE features, including a debugger. You can look at, you can inspect variables now. It's really nice. Uh, I know in the future, they're hoping to add collaborative editing. So it's a developing product. Uh, many, like, th there's many features were added in the last several years and many features are still coming. It's a project, it's open source. It's developed by uh, the project Jupyter and supported by NumFocus, which if you use NumPy and other data science libraries, you might be familiar with NumFocus. They're a big supporter of Python um, computational uh, libraries. So if you are considering Jupyter Lab, um, it's it's good if you are a scientist or communicator dealing with unstructured unstructured data or data analysis or data visualization. Um, many many things, tabular data with pandas, ML. It's good for that kind of work. Uh, less good for writing large software libraries. Though you, there is an extension called Notebook Dev that actually does support that. Uh, probably not so good for things like backend web development. And one caveat here that's pretty important for cloud is that parallelization is not straightforward uh, unless the library that you're using does it automatically. So if you're just writing regular Python code and you're not using any libraries that leverage multiple cores, moving it to the cloud and putting it on a big instance is probably not going to give you any, any speed bump. So it's something to consider carefully when you're, when you're trying to move uh, Python code. You're going to want to make sure that you're using libraries that can really leverage the, the power of the cloud instances. You may already be using Python, but maybe not Jupyter Lab. If that's the case, you're probably using um, something like Idle or another um, REPL. These are distributed with Python. It's an interpreter and maybe an editor with basic functionality. It's sort of like using classic R before we had a notebook. Um, it's a nice interactive way to use R and to use Python, but it doesn't produce a good log of what you've done. So it doesn't really document it. It's, it's not a notebook at the end. Uh, you might you might have encountered Jupyter Notebook. Um, that's still available. It, it's there right now. Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab are co-developed. Both of those products actually open notebook files, which is a little confusing because one of them has notebook in the name and one of them doesn't. But they actually both operate on notebooks. Uh, they're two different interfaces. The Jupyter Lab is the future direction for for Jupyter Notebook. So eventually, Jupyter Notebook will probably go away. So if you haven't tested out Jupyter Labs and you're using Jupyter Notebooks, I encourage you to try it out. Uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Code is actually pretty popular uh, for Python. It even has an extension that lets you write and view Jupyter Notebooks inside of its editor. One thing you might like less about Visual Studio Code is that it imposes a software development model and structure on your projects. Um, so if you 
if you're a scientist doing analysis and you have your own way of doing things, it'll feel like you're being forced <laughs> a little bit. Uh, it's also maybe less good for remote development than Jupyter Notebook or and Jupyter Lab. You may have also heard of PyCharm. It's a very powerful editor, it has a ton of features. It's very good for software development, but it's not really focused on data analysis or communication. It's not a, a notebook interface, but these are the main ways that, that I've seen people using Python in academia. So to think about Jupyter in the cloud, uh, first we have to think about how Jupyter works. And it, it has a couple of components. There's the part you look at, which is this web browser with the J Jupyter user interface. And that web browser communicates with uh, a Jupyter Lab server running on your computer. And that server then communicates with the Python kernel, which is the engine that drives the actual computation that goes on in the notebook. And that Python kernel accesses the data on your computer. So when you're running Python locally on your own computer, uh, all these components are running right there um, on the same machine. And about 10 years ago, um, someone realized that you know we could actually, we don't have to run all these components on the same machine. Let's put the web browser with the interface on one machine and we'll run the server on another machine the JupyterLab server on another machine and the kernels can run on that machine and our data can be on that machine. And that this is a, a model that's still widely used. Um, you have a big server at work with all your data on it. You run a JupyterLab server there and you connect to it with your laptop from home or from your office. And this is this was actually a pretty revolutionary way to use JupyterLab, Jupyter Notebooks because um, you could comfortably interact with your data on a remote machine in a way that was pretty transparent to you as the user. Um, one thing to notice about this situation though, is that all the Python kernels and that are running, each notebook has its own kernel. So all, every notebook you have open has its own kernel running on this machine. Um, the server's running on this machine. Uh, your data lives on this machine. So you're you're restricted by what you can do with your notebooks by the resources available on this you know, one server machine. It's nicer than having it than being restricted by the resources resources on your laptop, which would be much smaller than a server, but it's still you have a you run into resource limits because there's only you, a server can only be so large. Um, as as time went on, uh, we people realized oh you could keep you keep moving components out. So for instance, um, one uh, this is another popular model that you would probably you could run into today if you have a virtual server hosting uh, Jupyter Lab that you connect to. The kernels will still run on that same server, but you may, if you're using a cloud-based um, virtual computer, then the data probably doesn't all live on the instant. The, the data can live in a different place under for that um, cloud provider. Um, for example, it might be on. Um, Amazon Simple Storage Service, They're, they call it S3. Um, this is a, a common model. When JupyterLab really came into the cloud, uh, the the people offering it, the Amazon and Google, they they realized, well, we can go ahead and split off. There's no reason that the kernel has to run on the same computer as the server. We If we set up communication between those two computers, then we can have an instant, a virtual machine instance that's running just the kernel and another one that's running just the server and they can all talk to data that's hosted on, on our platform. So when we start using JupyterLab in the cloud, we're, we're breaking these components of, of, of the Jupyter, the overall JupyterLab uh, experience and putting them onto different machines. And that gives us more flexibility. That's why you might want to move to a cloud-based solution. Um, Nice thing here is that well, now that each kernel can potentially run on its own instance, then the resources used by that kernel could all be independent. So you can have multiple notebooks running. Each one is, is backed by a kernel running on a separate instance. So they are not your notebooks aren't competing with each other for resources anymore. So why won't you want to use Jupyter in the cloud? Uh, it could be because you need more resources than are available on your own computer. Uh, you can temporarily you know, borrow the resources of Amazon or Google to run a big analysis. You, If you've been running analyses on your laptop, you probably run into this situation where it, you know, the computation might take several hours. 
And so you have to set up your laptop, make sure it doesn't fall asleep and leave it behind in your desk so it can run overnight. Or you try to walk around carrying it open and you hope that it finishes before your battery runs out. Um, I think we've probably all been there. And that's something you could avoid if you can get your, your kernel running in the cloud instead of on your local machine. There's another reason why you might need to use Jupyter in the cloud, and that would be because your project uses a secure environment, a, a secure private cloud, and no one is allowed local access to their data. You can only access it through the cloud. And if you're in a project with sensitive information, this is a good way. Um, you, you, can, you, you could set up um, Jupyter Lab inside your private cloud and you could access your, your data, your familiar Jupyter Lab interface and analyze your data inside the secure private cloud. Yeah, I, <laughs> I see that in chat. Definitely walking around, trying to keep it open on the bus or trying to walk between buildings, hoping it doesn't uh, run out of battery before you get the, the next charger. There are some good reasons not to use Jupyter Lab in the cloud. Um, one of it is that one reason is that your cloud solutions will have to be evaluated by IT professionals before you put any identifying data on those solutions. Most of the free cloud options are not suitable for any sensitive or restricted data. It'll be both a bad idea and against your organizational policies. So before you start using a cloud-based Jupyter system, make sure that it doesn't violate any organizational policies about data sharing or data sensitivity. Um, I can't stress this enough. It's, a, it's easy to accidentally leak data through cloud services. So you'd want to be supported by IT professionals. So there's several cloud options available. Um, probably heard of Google Colab. That was one of the first uh, Jupyter-like um, offerings. Uh, I put a link there that, that's free and paid. There's also a, an enterprise version of Colab that might be available through your institution. If your institution decides to support it, then you could you would be able to access a, a more secure version of Jupyter Colab that runs inside of a, a, ma a managed environment. So um, if you need to use sensitive data, you might talk to your, whoever your, your institution is, you might talk to them about um, Google Cloud Platform Notebooks or Colab Enterprise and see if that's something that they have vetted and supported. Uh, another place that offers um, something like Jupyter Lab is say, is Amazon through their SageMaker service. There's a free version which you can sign up for. This is not the secure one. This is their the free offering. Uh, they also offer SageMaker Studio, which is something that would be provisioned and secured by your organization's IT team. And I am I'm working with a project at Wild Cornell that's using SageMaker Studio inside of a secured environment, and it's I've been have had the pleasure of testing and evaluating it over the last couple months, and I, I've been really enjoying it. So I'm going to talk about SageMaker Studio today. Um, if you're at Wild Cornell, I think it's the cloud-based platform that you're most likely to be able to use. And I think we have a another fire drill. These uh, Google and Amazon are not the only Google Notebook um, or Google Lab, I'm sorry. Jupyter Lab styled um, interfaces. There's uh, Microsoft has their own in their Azure service. And there's also um, third party providers like Paperspace. Uh, but like I said, SageMaker Studio, I think you have a real chance of using. <laughs> so uh, if you recall the basic Jupyter Lab interface, um, there's some elements that you would be familiar with from previous presentation. There's a file, a file browser showing you your local data. There's a list of active kernels. There's the outline that shows you the structure of your document. There's extensions. There's an inspector that shows your variables and their values and, the, and a debugger. And the first time you load the SageMaker Studio interface, uh, it's a little jarring. It has a dark theme applied, which is low contrast. And uh, it's got a few extra buttons. So. For me, the first thing I do when I log in is go to the uh, settings theme and choose the light theme. And already it looks much more familiar. Um, you see that there's several familiar items on here, um, including the yeah, file browser, the kernels. And there's a few new ones as well. Um, Amazon's added this, this home button. 
which includes a variety of Amazon specific features and also their launcher. They also added a GitHub integration. It's like an extension that you could install on your own Jupyter Lab, but this one comes with it uh, pre installed. So when you come to the, if you go to the home and you, you look at the uh, quick actions, there's a launcher button. If you open that launcher, this is where you actually create your, no your notebooks. Um, it's not quite as simple as creating the notebook when you're running it locally, because not only are you creating a notebook, you're also creating an instance to run that notebook. And so you have a, a choice of your what image, what kernel, and what instance type you're going to run on. And you can make you can change that choice by clicking the change environment button, and that'll bring up this this dialog box. Um, the image you can think of as like the software that's going to be available on the virtual machine. So it's going to be the operating system, libraries. If you have, uh, if you're running on a GPU instance, the GPU drivers are going to be installed in the image. Um, it, it can also include a variety uh, pre-installed packages. So um, I, you might make a custom image that has certain packages pre-installed, um, particularly if they're hard to install or take a long time to install. And that would all be bundled into an image. You can make these custom images using Docker, but you'll need the help of an ITS support person to actually get them into the environment. Um, it's something that I've been been doing, so I know how to how it works. So if you if you find yourself here and you have questions, you could reach out. So this is the image, um, which is the software. You also choose an instance type, and that's sort of like the hardware uh, for your virtual machine. It's going to control the number of processor cores, the RAM, and whether there's a GPU available. The default is this MLT3 medium. It's the least expensive, smallest instance type. Um, and it's great for just regular development. When you're typing, you don't need a lot of cores and a lot of RAM. So get your analysis set up and do some small test runs using this small instance type. And that'll uh, save your project a lot of money. The so that's hardware and software. Each um, image is going to have a Python kernel on it. The kernel usually is inside of a, a virtual environment for Python. So if you've ever used a Conda environment or a, a v, VNV, a virtual environment um, for Python, then you're kind of familiar with that idea. It's basically a set of packages. Um, and you say, OK, I want to use this set of packages. Um, you give it a name. It's a, it's a named set of packages. And you can say, OK, I want to use this, this environment and make it active. And then when you open notebooks, they're, they're operating inside of that environment. Um, and you could make additional envir environments for other projects or other things you, other types of analyses you might need to run. And in Jupyter Notebooks, there's a, a kernel that runs, you know, the, it, it operates the, the Python inside the notebook and it's part of that environment. So every image is going to have at least one kernel. Some of them will have multiple kernels. Um, PySpark, for instance, has, or the Spark um, image has both a, a Scala kernel and a, Py, a PySpark kernel, for instance. Um, kernel doesn't have to be uh, Python. It could also be R. I've seen that that working in, on SageMaker. But in any case, um, first you choose the image. Then there'll be a list of available kernels on that image that you can choose. You'll probably mostly want to use a Python 3-based kernel. Um, if you make a custom image, you will intentionally create an environment that has a kernel in it, and that's the one you'll select. So um, the last thing, there's startup scripts. I've been playing with it some. Um, I don't have a lot of advice yet on how to use startup scripts. I know there is a popular startup script. Uh, that runs in the background and it detects when your notebooks are, are idle. And if it finds an idle notebook, it will shut it down. That's a cost saving measure. So that's a popular startup script. Mostly I'm not using startup scripts just yet. Um, all of those selections that we are making about the image, the kernel, the instance type, those are impacting this kernel instance. And because they can be, because each kernel instance or each instance running a kernel can run and can be on separate virtual hardware, um, those choices really only impact that, that one notebook in the kernel that's backing it. So after you make your selections about which instance type you want to run your notebook on, then you can click Create Notebook. And 
it'll it'll start up a notebook. This will be very familiar to you if you're using Jupyter Lab locally. Um, look at a few of the other uh, elements of the interface and how they're different from regular Jupyter Lab. Uh, one of them is this files tab. So if you click on the files tab, you you have a list of files. Um, it's it is a a private volume that's associated with your SageMaker account. And it's a good, it's put there for you to save your notebooks and you can save credentials there if you mean to access databases or things like that, because this is a private space to, to for your account. Um, every, every interactive notebook that you run will be able to see these, the, the, the files that you have stored here on this volume. Um, I would recommend not putting data on these drives on, on this drive, uh, both both because it's more expensive and because uh, if you want to use this feature called notebook jobs, it does not have good access to this um, this volume. So it won't you won't be able to access this data running uh, notebook jobs. We'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, next thing, this is this is the running kernels um, and terminals. It's it's part of regular Jupyter Lab, but there's some extra information here now. Um, because all of the kernels are backed by a real instance running, um, this this has this extra section of running instances. And these anything here is costing your project money. It's billable time if there's an instance running. So make sure that the instances running are the ones you intend to be running. Um, stop them if they're if they're extra. Um, it's possible to have a notebook with an active kernel, but actually not have it open. That's happening here. I have three things open. One of them is a notebook. Um, I see its its uh, kernel session is running, but I also have these other two um, notebooks that have active kernels, but the notebooks themselves are closed. Uh, there's a little bit of optimization that Amazon will do where we'll It'll allow one instance to host multiple kernels. They have a complicated internal strategy for how much they'll they'll allow uh, kernels to share one instance. So right now I have three kernels running. They're all running on exactly one instance, which is great because those those extra two that I'm not using are actually not costing any extra money. Um, if you want to figure out, if, am I costing the project a lot of money? Look at the number of running instances and shut them down if you don't need them. Another important part, I, I know for when I'm using this locally, uh, JupyterLab locally, I will leave my notebooks open all the time and you know for weeks on end. Uh, you shouldn't do that on SageMaker because as long as it's active, it's you know accumulating a billing. So at the end of your day, after you start up these these notebooks, you should make sure you shut them all down by choosing the you going to the file menu, choosing shutdown, and then choose shutdown all. Um, in the pop-up dialog. And that will make sure that all of your running instances are closed and you're not accumulating any billing. Most of the packages, when you're when you're actually in a, a notebook on SageMaker, most of the packages can be installed using this uh, pip magic command. Um, you may have seen in the past uh, exclamation point instead, which runs it in a in a terminal, it runs it as if it was running on the command line. There's a, a new command, which is percent pip, and it it runs pip, and it tends to install things in an easier way, uh, a, a way that, that works better for SageMaker. So if you're going to install packages, use the pip magic command. If you have a very complicated installation, um, a package with a lot of C dependencies or something, you may need to actually end up with a custom Docker image. Also, if you're going to install the same set of packages every time, um, and they're slow to install. If it's something like the NLP package, where it just takes a long time to download, um, you may want to have a custom Docker image that has those pre-installed. And you can reach out to your project um, IT support rep for assistance with building those custom Docker images again. But for most, for the most part, I've been pretty successful just installing um, using this magic pip command. Now I told you not to put your data onto your um, SageMaker volume, and it's better to put it in S3. S3 is Amazon's simple storage service. And if it's part of your secure environment, your IT rep can provision a, a bucket uh, for you or multiple buckets, depending on, on your, your project and its needs. And if you have data in an S3 bucket, it's actually really easy to load it into your notebook. Uh, this is an example using Pandas, which is a, a, a 
data frame library for, for Python. If you import Boto3, which is an Amazon specific uh, package, then pandas can read directly um, off of S3 with basically no changes. So you just, you need to build up a path, um, which this describes the location of the data in the bucket. You need to give it a bucket name. You'll receive the bucket name from your support person. Um, the path on the bucket is something you need to work out with the rest of your project team. You should sort of agree on a structure for your bucket, um, choose a hierarchy of, of folders and figure out where you're gonna put things and then, and then just stick with it. Um, so that you're all being consistent. But uh, this just builds up a, a string that represents the path in the bucket and you just read CSV and it'll pull it right off and load it into the into your data into your um, Jupyter notebooks memory. So you can uh, easily process data. Later on, you could uh, export your data back to S3 uh, using a command like this. You want to change the path so you don't overwrite your your original data, but other than that, there's, there's really no extra considerations. This works easily and well. So converting a note, so you have you have a notebook that's designed to run locally that imports CSVs and that sort of thing. Uh, converting it to run in SageMaker is mostly a matter of pointing the, you know, putting that data up on S3 and pointing your notebook towards S3 instead of um, to local files. One of my favorite features about SageMaker Studio is this uh, notebook job feature. Um, for any notebook that you create, um, when, if you've sort of tested out the analysis and you're ready to run it on a larger scale, uh, you look for this little button that looks like an old flip top, uh, I guess top flip or flip top desktop calendar, uh, this little blue icon. It'll be up in the, in the menu bar. If you click that, it'll open up this interface for creating a notebook job. So a notebook job is, uh, an automated run of a notebook. It will automatically save the results and then it will put away the instance when that notebook is complete. So you can start a big job, something that would take six hours and you don't have to remember to come back in six hours and turn off the instance so that you're not racking up charges overnight. It'll automatically just use the, it'll be on for six hours and it'll put itself away and stop accumulating charges. I found it to be really convenient. So this one works really only works well if your data is on S3. It's designed with that in mind. So put your data files on S3, and then you're then you'll be good to go with your jobs. You'll be able to run them either interactively in through the Jupyter Lab or through the SageMaker interface, or you'll be able to run them as a notebook job. It's a good idea to use this for jobs that take like hundreds of cores or dozens of cores or or a lot of memory or they need a uh, GPU or something like that, something that costs extra money to use. Because you'll be, if you use it, run it as a notebook job, you can be sure that you'll use that expensive instance only as long as you need it, and then it puts itself away at the end. Uh, if you have a job that can be parallelized, you can run you know, multiple instances concurrently um, as using notebook jobs. It's a feature I won't talk about today, or I won't show today, but I'm going to talk about it right now. Um, you can add parameters to your notebook. So if you want to, um, if you, it, a parameter lets you, is sort of like, um, it's a value that can change between the runs of the notebook. So you can make a notebook job. Um, let's see what, maybe your, one thing you might use this for is if you have a bunch of data and you want to um, break, you want to, parallelize it, processing it over multiple instances, but uh, you kind of need to do it in a manual way because your your Python code isn't parallelizable. Um, you would say, uh, you would the parameter that you would give your notebook would be maybe the range of data files you want it to process. So the first one will get the first 100, the second job will get the second 100, uh, the third per, uh, job will get the, the third 100, <laughs> you know, so you can, you can use a parameter to tell um, a notebook which which part of the data it should it should analyze. For instance, um, if that sounds like something you need, I encourage you to look into it a little more. So if you click this um, this notebook jobs button that looks like a little calendar, uh, it'll bring up this create a notebook job interface. Uh, again, you're you're going to spin up an instance to run this notebook. So uh, the choice of notebook is automatic. It'll whatever you are looking at when you 
when you created the job will be auto-populated here. You need to choose a compute type, uh, which is actually the instance type. And if you expand the additional options, you have a choice of image and kernel. The image and kernel will be filled in based on what you were last using with this notebook. So if, you're, if you've been running this notebook locally with the kernel that you like, then these values will be correct. You won't have to change them. Um, but you will want to change the compute type. You want to put that on some probably something bigger, uh, depending on the type of notebook you're running. Um, at the bottom, there's an option to run now, and you click Create. There's also an option to run on a schedule, which allows you to, if you have something like um, you're getting data every week and you want to run a processing script on it, then you could schedule a, a notebook job to run um, every every week on a regular basis. As far as I can tell, there's not an option to schedule it to run later, which I, I kind of wish there was a run later option where I could say, start this tomorrow, but I'll, I only want it to run, to run one time. Um, your option is to run it now or run it you know, weekly or daily or uh, some, some kind of repeating schedule, but no, no scheduling for the future. So mostly you'll just click run now, you click create, and that will add it to this notebook job. To find your jobs, you go to the home tab on the side and then down to notebook jobs. It'll show you a list of running and completed jobs. And I'll zoom in on this little bit of the interface so you can see it better. Um, here's an example of a job that, this one's completed, but I haven't looked at its output files yet. So when it completes, it'll say it's completed. Um, when you, there'll be this download button. If you click it, it will, collect all of the output files that were created by this uh, notebook job and put them in your local in your uh, your SageMaker volume. And also it'll add these links so you can easily open them. The output you probably care about the most is the one labeled output. It is your notebook, except it shows all of the all of the results from the execution. Um, you know, uh, it has result cells. Um, I will say though, that if you design your analysis to write the results to S3, you probably only need to inspect these outputs if something goes wrong. So if you get a failed job, um, you look and figure out which cell failed. Um, or if you add some debugging code, you wanna kind of you add some timing code, for instance, you wanna know how long different parts of your code took, then you might come to this output um, to see how, how it, the execution worked. Uh, Amazon offers many dozens of instance types. They organize them into some general categories. There's a general purpose, which have a balance of RAM and CPU. Then there's ones with higher RAM for people that are using RAM that need RAM intensive um, compute. Then there's ones with more CPU, so where people that have a lot of CPU but less RAM needs. And then there's a, a group of accelerated computing instances that have either GPUs or uh, tensor processing units, TPUs. Um, a few examples of the of general purpose instances. These are some instance names um, that you probably run into. You can see the number of cores can be quite small or pretty large. Um, this is probably less powerful than your laptop, and this is probably quite a bit more powerful than your than your laptop. And prices tend to scale fairly linearly, so this is you know probably fifty times more expensive than <laughs> using the the default instance type. For instance, so um, you when you have a notebook job, uh, if it's parallelizable, you can get it complete it faster by using a big core. It's really important though to note that adding additional cores doesn't automatically make Python code faster. It's very likely will not make your Python code faster unless you're using uh, specific libraries that are designed to support multi-core processing. So before you take your code that you've tested on your two-core um, your development instance uh, before you throw it onto a 96 core instance and hope for the best. Um, yes, I think there's probably are some AP. I think there are some models um, with APUs as well. But um, just so before you you try to run your code on something huge uh, in hopes that it'll be faster, please just try the next instance size up and make sure that your code really scales the way you expect. Otherwise you're just, uh, you'd be you know, paying 50 times more to find out that it's gonna run the same speed as it would have run on two cores. So for cloud considerations, I want to uh, 
point out that having a secure and conforming environment is going to require uh, your IT group to, to help you set it up. Your The installation and customization is more complicated than running it locally. Um, and since that notebook kernel is running on a virtual machine, you need to choose the specs and you, you have to choose and the specs you choose will determine the cost of running those jobs. So there's a little more responsibility than when you're running it running Jupyter Lab locally. Um, the product that you use, whatever Jupyter Lab like product you use, will probably tie into the larger company ecosystem. So on Amazon, that means it ties into S3 and their um, their virtual computer compute um, service called EC2, um, and they tie into those. But because they tie into those, they're able to offer extra features um, like those scheduled notebook runs. I know Google Enterprise offers scheduled notebook runs, and I think Azure does as well. Uh, but those are only available in the enterprise um, environments. They're not available as part of the free tier. Um, important to, just to reiterate, the using a high resource instance will not necessarily make your code run faster. You need to make sure that your code is uh, able to use those extra resources. And I've been using SageMaker, and I, I've been enjoying it. I like it as a, I think for most people that want to have a, a virtual server that they want that they install Jupyter Lab on and then use, um, you know, remotely. I think SageMaker would be a great alternative to that use case, and I I see a lot of that use case. So I'm hoping that this is something that uh, eventually gets rolled out and made available to people in the Wild Cornell community and at other institutions as well. I think I'll stop there. I have a few slides. You'll get these slides. I have a few slides about Google Colab, but they are not. Um, I don't go in depth on Google uh, Colab. It already has great documentation and good onboarding. Um, the interface is similar, but a little, there, there's a few changes, uh, particularly that they, the syntax highlighting is different and the keyboard shortcuts are different. So it never quite feels like I'm at home when I'm using a Colab. Um, so you'll get these slides and um, I included an appendix here about installing Jupyter Lab desktop. It's a new way of installing Jupyter Lab locally. Um, I, it's it's out of beta and it is now available. It's quite nice. Um, this is a brief overview of how to install it and get it set up. Um, it references the previous presentation on Jupyter Cloud, which you can you'll be able to find a recording of listed on the website.